Tonight, President Biden speaks to Israel's Prime Minister and offers support in the war against Hamas. It comes as mass fires rockets from Gaza into the southern Israeli city of Ashkelon. Well, back here in the UK, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, urges the police to use the full force of the law against displays of support for Hamas. <laughs> And here at the Labour Party conference in Liverpool, Keir Starmer brushes off his critics and promises Britain a decade of renewal. Was this the pitch from a prime minister in waiting? All that and more with Margaret Hodge and Owen Jones, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Tuesday, I'm Sophie Ridge. We're live from the Labour Party conference in Liverpool, and this is the Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Well, we're going to have all the analysis of that speech from Keir Starmer here in Liverpool throughout the programme. But first, let's get the latest on the situation in the Israel-Gaza war, which has seen rockets fired towards the Israeli city of Ashkelon by Hamas and an announcement by the Israeli Defence Forces that the bodies of 1,500 Hamas militants have been found following Saturday's incursion. Here's our international correspondent, John Sparks. Four days after its surprise attack on Israel, militant group Hamas signals its determination to fight on, launching a missile barrage from Gaza this afternoon. Sky News captured the Israeli response here on the streets of Ashkelon in southern Israel. The country's Iron Dome defensive system sending missiles skyward to intercept. In another battle fought near the border with Gaza, we see Israelis conduct an operation on a farm called Nir Am. <laughs> Members of the police trade fire with militant fighters as they attempt to rescue civilians and injured soldiers. <laughs> Four days of intense warfare as the Israeli security forces attempt to regain control. Here, two militants are stopped in their car near the city of Netivot. Part of a campaign the Israelis say they're winning. The defense force is in full control of the communities around Gaza and no terrorists infiltrated the border last night. But there are isolated incidents where we've been encountering them. 360,000 Israeli reservists have been told to report for duty, with many now in operation in the country's south. Officials say they aim to take full control of the frontier with Gaza in the next few hours. Israel controls the skies above the Strip, and they've used their jets to deliver hundreds of airstrikes, bombarding the residential and commercial district in the centre of Gaza City overnight. The UN says 190,000 residents have been displaced. I mean, there was a lot of airstrikes, bombardments around us, and, in fact, the building was shaking. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, I haven't been out of the shelter for a couple of days, and today I have to go to the pharmacy to bring some medications for the people here, and just walked across the compound. I haven't been outside, and the debris, the glass in the uh, yard and in the other buildings, you, it's like aftermath of a, a earthquake. Some are questioning Israeli tactics, with the number of deaths and injuries climbing rapidly. This, the entrance to Gaza City's main hospital, with scenes of chaos and distress. May God take revenge on them. They've displaced us all. My money and identity are lost, said this man. Israel is awash with grief and fury as pictures emerge of militants murdering Israelis on Saturday morning. At the entrance of Be'eri Kibbutz, Gunmen fired at the unsuspecting occupants of this car. Then they enter the farm, where more than 100 residents were massacred. 
These are acts of hatred that cannot be erased. John Sparks, Sky News. Well, we're going to have lots more on the war between Israel and Hamas. We'll be hearing from Joe Biden at some point as well this evening, we expect, which we'll bring you just as soon as we get at the US president expected to speak uh, after his show of support for Israel. Um, in the meantime, to return to Labour Party conference here in Liverpool, Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party, pitching to be leader of the United Kingdom. And what better time to make that pitch than at party conference? He got off to a dramatic start. A protester making it onto the stage, glitter everywhere. And just look how long it took for security to react. There's going to be recriminations for sure about that. But shirt sleeves rolled up, sparkles in his hair still. Keir Starmer cracked on, and he'll get credit for that. Now, in the hall, he was treated as a rock star, even coming back onto the stage for a final encore after the speech. But here's my question. If there was a criticism of Labour before the speech, it was this, that we don't really know enough about what they would do if they were in power, other than the fact that they wouldn't be like the Tories. And after the speech, well, I'm still not completely clear. Other than a pledge to build 1.5 million homes, this was a speech that was pretty light on policy. We know what Kirstama thinks the problem is, housing and NHS on its knees, a cost of living crisis. That means people pick up a tree to the supermarket just to put it back on the shelf. Those are the problems. But honestly, I'm still not totally sure how he was going to fix all of them. He says he wants growth, a reforming state, better public services with an iron grip on the public finances. That's the destination. But we still don't know exactly how he's going to get there. Maybe that doesn't matter. It didn't matter to the people in the hall. They think that Keith Starmer is going to win the next election anyway. And they might be right. We'll be talking a lot about that speech. We'll be dissecting what is going on here in Liverpool. We're now joined, I'm pleased to say, by the Shadow Justice Secretary, that's Shabana Mahmood. Lots of questions. Thank you very much for being with you, us, on the programme this morning. Um, first, I just want to talk about the protester. Is, is Keir Starmer OK? Yes, I saw him, actually, not long before I rushed across to join you for this show. He's in great heart. Um, you know, obviously, it's not the start uh, to a speech that anybody would have wanted, but I thought he dealt with it brilliantly well. He was just, you know, he kept his cool, he kept calm. Uh, he was determined uh, to give that speech and not let anyone or anything derail him. And, and, you know, he's very chipper, he's in good heart, as I say, and he's really pleased with how it went. Yeah, he obviously dealt with it very well, but I guess there is a serious point here, you know, MPs regularly receive death threats. We've had these appalling cases of MPs being attacked. You know, is there an investigation going on into how long it took security service to respond? Yes, I, I, I know that questions are being asked this mm. evening, and uh, I know that the uh, party's national executive, of which I am a member, will be expecting, mm. uh, you know, a full uh, account of exactly how that was allowed to happen. I know that there are uh, discussions going on with the security staff at conference uh, as well. Look, you know, as a member of parliament, as, as I was watching that unfold, you know, it was incredibly worrying. Mm. Um, and you're right, those uh, those 30 seconds also that it took for security to get up on stage. They felt like they lasted almost 30 minutes, frankly. Yeah. But, uh, as I say, uh, look at how Keir dealt with it. You know, he stayed calm. Um, he, you know, he held his nerve. Uh, he reacted exactly as we could have wished for in, you know, circumstances that were obviously deeply unpleasant for him personally. I'm sure those questions are being asked. I know they're being asked. Uh, we will have answers. We will make sure that can never happen again. Um, let's talk about the content speech, shall we? We don't want to be overshadowed, of course, by the protester. It felt like there was a strong narrative about the state of Britain, but it was quite light on policies, right? So I think that's actually quite ungenerous, if I'm honest. I mean, look, you know, Keir, what was he doing in that speech? He set out a long-term plan to get our country its future back uh, and to put us on a trajectory of national renewal over the course of a decade, making no apologies for the fact that we are thinking and talking about long-term solutions because the challenges our country has, these are not things that you can put right overnight. Uh, and an incoming Labour government, if we are lucky enough to win that next general election, have the chance to serve our country, we're not going to be able to wave a magic wand uh, and make everything all right immediately because the economic inheritance that would be left by this Tory government, it, it's poor. I mean, they have crashed the economy. Everybody's paying more as a result of it. Uh, so there is going to be less money around. So do you think people might be a bit disappointed? No, because, because you know, but, as you say, whoever about, wins the next election, you're going to have these same about that, The scale of that national renewal, because even, even with all of these constraints, there are things that Keir set out today in his speech that an incoming Labour government would be 
able to do straight away 13,000 police officers in our streets. You know, neighbourhoods are going to have neighbourhood policing again. People will see that difference as soon as a Labour government is elected. So practical things that we can do straight away to start easing some of the pressures in our communities across the whole of the country. And then a really huge statement of intent on house building. You know, one of the single biggest ways that we can unlock economic growth in our country, but also help people in our country realise that dream of home ownership. I mean, he makes no apology for the fact that's a long term programme. But, you know, for a generation we have not built enough homes in our country. It's going to need a Prime Minister and a government that's going to roll their sleeves up, do the hard slog, the knotty bits of government delivery, mm -hmm. and get the job what, done. What I guess the Conservatives would say to this is, you know, if, if you are so committed to house building and say, look, this is the one thing we want to do, why would you not be supporting measures that they brought in, like such as, um, for example, watering down some of the environmental rules around house building that would actually get house building you know, up. We, we, we refuse to accept that, you know, you can either have uh, watered down environmental rules or, or housing. You know, so you're we, pro we, cake we and eating it. Well, no, listen, we, we believe that it's possible to set our country on a road where we can deliver one and a half million homes over, over a period of five years and that the, those homes are net zero compliant. They are homes that people want to live in. They are communities that people want to be in and that they have all of the social infrastructure around them that supports a community. Too many developments in our country are not where people want to live, of a kind of housing that people don't want to access. Um, so people think that actually, you know, the nation is just full of NIMBYs who want to say no to projects all the time. Actually, much more than that, we have people who want homes in their communities, but not where their developers want to put things, where they want them, and that's what a Labour government would unlock. I have to say, it's a busy conference. Um, people feel pretty pumped up. Yeah. How much money would you put on Labour winning the next election? Oh, you're talking to a practising Muslim, so I don't do gambling. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you there, I'm afraid. And I used to be the uh, party's election coordinator, so I can tell you my message to everybody is, you, and it's exactly what Keir said to them in the hall okay. today, no complacency. You know, we're, we, uh, we still have a long way to go between now and the general election. I want to talk to you about Israel now and the, the war that we've seen between Israel and Hamas. Um, and there was a very striking moment, of course, when Keir Starmer spoke about this uh, in his speech, saying he condemns the murder of people in cold blood by the terrorists of Hamas. Labour is saying that Israel has the right to defend itself. What does that mean? How far does that right go? Well, as, as our Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lamy has been uh, saying uh, over the last few days, of course, uh, Israel has a right to defend itself, to bring those hostages home, uh, to protect her citizens. Uh, that is exactly the same as any other country would be in the same t horrific but, situation. But how far does that go? Well, everyone, everyone would, everyone would obviously... We have to be guided by international law. International mm. law requires uh, any response to be proportionate in so line with international cutting law. cutting off water, and, for example, to Gaza, is that, pr well, is that proportionate? Well, look, I mean, I'm not going to get into the specifics there. Look, we know what international there, law. We know, we know that for international law you have to prioritise the protection of uh, civilians, for example, so we would just call on uh, all leaders uh, to remember that, you know, it is important that we act in, in line with international law, but of course uh, we also can so, understand so cut, that we are cut, in this situation off, where cut, live attacks off. are still taking place as we speak. Suella Bravman has written to police uh, in the UK, urging them to clamp down on any attempts to use flags, songs or swastikas to harass or intimidate members of the Jewish community. Do you support what she's saying? Uh, yes, look, we have strong rules in this country um, about incitement to violence and hate speech and, you know, we do have the right to protest, but there are, of course, rules about uh, the, the things that you can say uh, in public uh, and making sure that those are not inflammatory and outside of the law of our land. And it's important that the police apply the law of our land and that's important to give uh, the British Jewish community some confidence uh, and that we are all across the political spectrum going to take a zero-tolerance approach to any anti-Semitism that we might see uh, in the coming days would, as a result of the protests and also what's been happening. Would waving a Palestinian flag be a criminal offence? Oh, look, I'm, I, it's, it's all about context, these laws. I don't think it's appropriate for me to start setting out uh, conditions. Um, the police know it's what the law of our land is. The police know what the law of our land is. Uh, context matters. The context of what is being said matters. That's always going to be the case. But where the police can see a breach of the laws of our land, they should apply the law of our land. OK, thank you very much, Barbara Marie, there uh, for the Labour Party good to have you here at conference. Uh, let's get a bit more now on Keir Starmer's speech. Here is our political editor, Beth Rigby. Here he is, a man who now believes he's on a march to power. 
this speech a moment, he has to make count. It's not just about the Tories losing the next election. Keir Starmer wants to win the argument. Thank you, conference. But the careful choreography interrupted before he'd even got underway. True democracy oh. is citizen-led. Politics needs an update. Sir Keir covered in glitter by a protester. This a security breach that could have been far worse. To mobilise, to preserve life, to update politics, let people decide. But he's a man undeterred, jacket off, sleeves rolled up. Back to business. If he thinks that bothers me, he doesn't know me. <laughs> this the pitch. Today we turn the page, answer the question, why Labour? With a plan for a Britain built to last, with higher growth, safer streets, cheap British power in your home, more opportunity in your community, the NHS off its knees, a Britain with its future back. His mission for government turned into campaign slogans, turbocharging house building, today the key pledge. So it's time to get Britain building again. It's time to build one and a half million new homes across the country. <laughs> Opportunities for first time buyers in every community. And a leader trying to connect with voters lost. And this isn't over. In fact, it's barely begun. We've dragged this party back to service and we can do the same for politics. I grew up working class. I've been fighting all my life and I won't stop now. I've felt the anxiety of a cost of living crisis before and until your family can see the way out, I will fight for you. This man is likely to be your next Prime Minister if the polls are right. And you can hear the energy, the enthusiasm, you can see it in the hall. But Keir Starmer doesn't just want the Tories to lose. He wants Labour to win. And he wants to convince you, the voter, that his vision for Britain is worthy of the keys to number 10. Keir Starmer is the enemy of complacency. I do think, though, when people look at that speech and judge the strength of that leader, I'm leaving this hall and leaving this conference feeling inspired about the change we could offer our country, but we need people's permission to do it. He came on for an encore, like some sort of, like he was like a rock star. He is. I was like... He's a rock star politician, rock for sure. Star. He's a rock star, but he also looks like a... <laughs> I don't know if the word bubble around Keir Starmer ever said rock star. But I think it says Prime Minister, doesn't it? That was the best speech I've ever seen from a Labour leader at conference. Do you think he's better than Blair in his delivery there? Oh, well, look, people he asked... He said the best one you've uh, ever seen. People asked when he was first elected, you know, is he Kinnock, is he Smith, is he Blair? Now, let's be frank, at, at the minute, he's on track to do what all of those leaders did in a much shorter space of time. Let's get Britain's future back, the slogan in here. But the sentiment Starmer's created is more than hope. It's conviction that this party is on its way to power. Beth Rigby, Sky News in Liverpool. Well, Beth joins us now. It really struck me, the response you got from the hall. I mean, they were loving it. I, it was so noisy in there. Mm. Uh, there was this stand innovation. He came out to do an encore uh, with his wife, Victoria, and, and the crowd were clearly delighted. And I think what it reflected were two things. One, I think he believed he landed the speech as he needed to, as he wanted to. And two, there was a Labour party en masse mm. in that hall that is willing this man on. Mm. And whatever he said, even if it were not, you know, traditional Labour messages, if you like, he was given a round of applause. And what struck me, Sophie, in terms of the pitch of that speech, you can look... There's lots of conversations. Is this 1991, the year before Kinnock lost the 92 mm. election, or is this 1996, the year before the Blair landslide? 
That we will mm. find out mm. in the mm. coming months when mm. you know, the test is at the ballot box. But I think what Starmer was doing in that speech was he was trying to make it about 96 because mm. he wasn't just talking to the hall in a way perhaps Kinnett was more. That was a pitch beyond the hall mm. uh, to the voter. There was a lot in it about... Uh, moderate conservatives fed up with the conservative mm. party come back to us he talked about aspiration he talked about private enterprise mm. he talked about uh, taxation and competitive taxation he talked about economic growth he didn't really talk much anything really about funding public services for example mm. and all of this was about talking beyond the hall in a way that blair did in 96 where he said this is why we lost mm. four elections to the Tories. You know, and he made that, uh, that comment about talking to voters and them saying that Labour was no longer the party of aspiration, that they felt that Labour held them back, not pushed them forward. He was trying to replicate mm. that in the speech. So the hall was already with him. I think the really big question is, in terms of voters out there, does he land it? Does it change mm. his personal ratings? Mm. And does it move the column from we don't know, he doesn't stand for anything, mm. to them beginning to think, mm. yes, maybe we do want him to be mm. uh, our next prime minister? I mean, it's a massive question. Mm. It will take months, France, and there'll be a, a very long and arduous campaign in between those two things. But, you know, one of his aides said to me afterwards, they burst into tears afterwards. Sangham uh, Debonair said to me that she thought it was the speech of his life. And that gives you a reflection of how people around mm. him felt about that mm. delivery. So he's kind of got that far. But now we're going to see with the polls and the polling on him how it lands. It's going to be really interesting. We've got a bit on that later, actually, when Nick Martin's been talking to people. So I'll be interested mm. to see how they find it. And Beth, thank you very much indeed. You're watching The Politics Hub. We're live from Labour Party conference in Liverpool, still to come. Reaction from our panel to that speech by Keir Starmer. There's been a lot of attention, people worried about bedbugs coming across from France, but the reality is we already have a large enough problem in the UK. Um, just yesterday there were videos of people showing bedbugs crawling on people on the tube system in London. So the thing that sparked all the concern in Paris is already happening in London. So, first of all, they're what's referred to as an exposure pest. On the, pest. Telly, on the um, table, rather. If that could be seen. Yeah. OK. They're basically a very small insect, start off at about two millimetres in size, go yeah. up to about 15. They love to hide in cracks and crevices. Right. So um, the key thing is when people are travelling and staying away from home, spend three to five minutes to check the bed. So what you they're do... They're tiny though, so how do you check? Well, what you do, drop your bag into the bath yeah. and go to the head end of the bed, move the sheets back, and you're looking for live samples, the car skins and the fetal traces, the little black dots that you see on the uh, detection skirt there. OK. So if you see any of those signs, you move to a different room, and that way you've avoided contact in the first place. Now, outside of that, because we, the problem has exploded so rapidly over the last decade, they're now in public spaces, cinemas, doctor surgeries, hospitals, all over the place, you then have to check your own bed. So, the reality is we spend an average of 180 hours a month sleeping in our beds, so we really should give them the respect of 30 minutes once a month to clean them. So we strip the sheets off, vacuum through the top of the mattress, turn the mattress, other side, lift the mattress off and do the frame of the bed. Now, if you check a passive monitor that's on the bed at the time, then you'll detect a problem within that first critical 30 days where the solution can be as simple as removing the device, cleaning the room with a vacuum cleaner, put a fresh one down. We're going, to take, we're going to take you straight to the White House where President Biden is speaking about that war in Israel and Gaza. ...is unleashed on this world. The people of Israel lived through one such moment this weekend. The bloody hands of the terrorist organization Hamas 
a group whose stated purpose for being is to kill Jews. This was an act of sheer evil. More than 1,000 civilians slaughtered, not just killed, slaughtered in Israel. Among them, at least 14 American citizens killed. Parents butchered, using their bodies to try to protect their children. Stomach-turning reports of being babies being killed. Entire families slain. Young people massacred while attending a musical festival to celebrate peace, to celebrate peace. Women raped, assaulted, paraded as trophies. Families hid their fear for hours and hours, desperately trying to keep their children quiet to avoid drawing attention. And thousands of wounded, alive but carrying with them the bullet holes and the shrapnel wounds and the memory of what they endured. You all know these traumas never go away. There's still so many families desperately waiting to hear the fate of their loved ones, not knowing if they're alive or dead or hostages. Infants in their mother's arms, grandparents in wheelchairs, Holocaust survivors abducted and held hostage. Hostages whom Hamas has now threatened to execute in violation of every code of human morality. It's abhorrent. The brutality of Hamas, these bloodthirstiness brings to mind the worst, the worst rampages of ISIS. This is terrorism. But sadly, for the Jewish people, it's not new. This attack has brought to the surface painful memories and the scars left by a millennia of anti-Semitism and genocide of the Jewish people. So in this moment, we must be crystal clear. We stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. And we will make sure Israel has what it needs to take care of its citizens, defend itself, and respond to this attack. There's no justification for terrorism. There's no excuse. Hamas does not stand for the Palestinian people's right to dignity and self-determination. Its stated purpose is the annihilation of the state of Israel and the murder of Jewish people. They use Palestinian civilians as human shields. Hamas offers nothing but terror and bloodshed, with no regard to who pays the price. The loss of innocent life is heartbreaking. Like every nation in the world, Israel has the right to respond, indeed has a duty to respond to these vicious attacks. I just got off the phone with a third call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I told him, the United States experience with Israel experiencing our response to be swift, decisive, and overwhelming. We also discussed how democracies like Israel and the United States are stronger and more secure when we act according to the rule of law. Terrorists pur purposely target civilians, kill them. We uphold the laws of war, the law of war. It matters. There's a difference. Today, Americans across the country are praying for all those families that have been ripped apart. A lot of us know how it feels. It leaves a black hole in your chest when you lose family. Feeling like you're being sucked in. The anger, the pain, the sense of hopelessness. This is what they mean by a human tragedy. An atrocity on an appalling scale. But we're going to continue to stand united supporting the people of Israel who are suffering unspeakable losses and opposing the hatred and violence of terrorism. My team has been in near constant communication with our Israeli partners and partners all across the region and the world from the moment this crisis began. We're surging additional military assistance, including ammunition and interceptors to replenish Iron Dome. We're going to make sure that Israel does not run out of these critical assets to defend its cities and its citizens. 
My administration has consulted closely with Congress throughout this crisis. And when Congress returns, we're going to ask them to take urgent action to fund the national security requirements of our critical partners. This is not about party or politics. This is about the security of our world, the security of the United States of America. We now know that American citizens are among those being held by Hamas. I've directed my team to share intelligence and deploy additional experts from across the United States government to consult with and advise Israeli counterparts on hostage recovery, recovery efforts. Because as President, I have no higher priority than the safety of Americans being held hostage around the world. The United States has also enhanced our military force posture in the region to strengthen our deterrence. The Department of Defense has moved the USS Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group to the Eastern Mediterranean and bolstered our fighter aircraft presence. And we stand ready to move in additional assets as needed. Let me say again to any country, any organization, anyone thinking of taking advantage of this situation, I have one word. Don't. Don't. Our hearts may be broken, but our resolve is clear. Yesterday, I also spoke with the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, and UK to discuss the latest developments with our European allies and coordinate our united response. This comes on top of days of steady engagement with partners across the region. We're also taking steps at home. In cities across the United States of America, police departments have stepped up, security around centers for, of Jewish life. And the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigation are working closely with state and local law enforcement and Jewish community partners to identify and disrupt any domestic threat that could emerge in connection with these horrific attacks. This is a moment for the United States to come together to grieve with those who are mourning. Let's be real clear. There is no place for hate in America. Not against Jews, not against Muslims, not against anybody. We reject, we reject, what we reject is terrorism. We condemn the indiscriminate evil, just as we've always done. That's what America stands for. You know, just over 50 years ago, I was thinking about it this morning, talking to the Secretary of State, the Vice President in my office. Over 50 years ago, as a young senator, I visited Israel for the first time as a newly elected senator. And I had a long, long trip a meeting with Golda Meir in her office just before the Yom Kippur War. And I guess she could see the consternation on my face as she described what was being faced, they were facing. We walked outside in that, uh, that sort of hallway outside her office to have some photos. She looked at me all of a sudden and said, would you like to have a photograph? And so I got up and followed her out. We were standing there silent, looking at the press. She could tell, I guess, I was concerned. She leaned over and whispered to me. She said, don't worry, Senator Biden. We have a secret weapon here in Israel. My word is what she said. We have no place else to go. We have no place else to go. For 75 years, Israel has stood as the ultimate guarantor of the security of Jewish people around the world so that the atrocities of the past could never happen again. And let there be no doubt, the United States has Israel's back. We will make sure the Jewish and democratic state of Israel can defend itself today, tomorrow, as we always have. It's as simple as that. These atrocities have been sickening. We're with Israel. Let's make no mistake. Thank you. Mr. President, 
Joe Biden there, the president of the United States, uh, saying that the people of Israel have lived through a moment of what he described as unadulterated evil, uh, saying that Israel has the right to and the duty to respond to the attacks and to defend itself. Well, our US correspondent Mark Stone is at the White House for us this evening. Uh, Mark, some very strong words there from President Biden. Yes, Sophie, it was, I thought, a visceral uh, reflection of a horrific uh, weekend there from uh, President Biden, an emotional um, President Biden. This was a message uh, to the American people, but it was a message to so uh, to well beyond that. It was a message to Israel, but it was a message to the Jewish people uh, worldwide uh, as well. I, I thought that was threaded through uh, the whole speech. It was powerful stuff. He, he talked about Holocaust survivors uh, having been uh, abducted. Um, he talked about it bringing to mind the worst rampages of ISIS, some of the um, stories that have been emerging uh, from those kibbutz uh, to, uh, on the border with Gaza, um, those Israeli kibbutz. The, the stories are just horrific, and he referenced uh, some of those as well. We stand with Israel, he said, twice. He repeated it. Um, he talked about the innocent loss of life having been heartbreaking and that Israel has the right uh, to, uh, to respond. He said, I've directed my teams to share intelligence and, I thought this was interesting, to deploy experts from across the US government. So there are now uh, experts on the ground in Israel, he says, or on their way to Israel to help um, with uh, what will be a very difficult uh, few days. He talked specifically uh, about the hostages, among them Americans. We know too, and it was confirmed to us earlier on, uh, that President Biden has directed um, hostage uh, help uh, for hostage experts to help to try and get those hostages out of Gaza. We're told that won't involve boots on the ground. I think that means that won't involve boots on the ground in Gaza. But clearly, from what the president just said, it will involve uh, American officials in in Israel to help out uh, with that. Uh, I thought there was a very interesting direct message in the middle of that speech as well, though. He, he talked um, uh, about, uh, well, the words were interesting. He said, we also, he referred to the discussion that he's just had with Prime Minister uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he said, we also discussed how democracies are stronger when we act according to the rule of law. We will uphold the law of war. That was a direct reference to anxieties behind the scenes about what Israel's uh, operation in Gaza will look like over the coming days. I've spoken uh, to uh, White House officials over the past uh, couple of days who have said, who have repeated that line, we trust Israel uh, to uphold the laws of war. Uh, he's holding President Netanyahu to that, but it is equally clear that Israel believes it must do what it needs to do in order to end the scourge of how Hamas as it sees it. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Mark Stone there reporting for us by the White House. Well, let's bring in our panel now, shall we? The former Minister, Senior Labour MP, Dame Margaret Hodge, and the author and Guardian columnist, Owen Jones. I mean, I don't even know where to start. I mean, the, the, the stories that are coming out, and we're learning more and more about this, it is heartbreaking, it is sickening, as you know, President Biden was saying, um, Margaret, you were talking earlier um, before we went on air about how you visited the kibbutz recently that we have seen some of these horrors emerging from. Yeah, I've got a lump in my throat, Sophie, mm. so I'm sorry about that, but I, I was at Kafar Azar in February. Mm. We spent a day there. And it's, um, I spent the day with a third generation kibbutznik, so the, the kibbutz has been there for ages. And as you walk to the periphery of the kibbutz, you could hear the call to prayer from the Muslims on the Gaza side. And you did think, for goodness sake, why don't these two communities talk to each other? But what was so awful, it's, it isn't a rich kibbutz. It sort of felt to me like an inner sort of, it, you know, inner council estate. You know, mm -hmm. the housing wasn't very well off. They made their money from a plastics factory. And every home had a covering so, because they were used to bombs. They had a minute mm. to, get to, their, uh, to get to the shelters. Um, and uh, the, you, and the, the, the covering was supposed to protect their homes. Now, what is so awful is the people I've travelled with have been in touch with the woman who showed us around, spent the day with us and showed us around, and she's been WhatsApping with us. And what I, we now realise is that probably the WhatsApps that came back weren't from her, they were from Hamas. And the idea that 40 babies were killed there 
uh, some of them beheaded, that um, homes were ruined, that adults were killed. We don't know how many are left of the people that we met there. It's just beyond, beyond horrible. And what is worse about it is I think it's going to get worse before it gets mm. better. Mm. And I just, you know, I haven't got relatives and friends there, but, you know, obviously as a part of the Jewish community, everybody I talk to has got somebody they know there, a cousin, brother-in-law, you know, a brother or sister, somebody is there. Uh, and this absolutely horrific bit of terrorism is condemned. Well, I condemn it. I stand by Israel. I was proud today that there was a standing ovation when mm. Keir said he stands by Israel. Mm. Uh, and I just, Israel has got the right to defend itself. I hope they do that within the rule of law. And what is particularly depressing for me, having been there in February, I think this has pushed back for Mm. years, if not decades, the idea that we can never come to a peaceful solution. It's pushed the agenda back. The terrorists have, have managed that. They're out, you know, maybe that's what they wanted, but it's uh, pushed that agenda uh, into the background rather than bringing it forward. Thank you, Feb. I know it must be really difficult after you've been there, you've met some of the people who are living there, and so thank you for sharing you know, your experiences of it. It does bring it to life, what some of those horrors are that we've seen. Do you share that fear that things are going to get worse before they get better? Yes, of course. And obviously, firstly, it's so important to share the disgust and horror um, at what happened. I was at a rave on Saturday with my friend who's an Israeli citizen, and I was with him as he took a call from his family. His niece escaped that rave. Uh, two of her friends um, were kidnapped and are now being held hostage uh, by, by Hamas. There's no cause on earth which justifies the slaughter of innocent civilians and, you know, the horror and disgust uh, you know, is raw with so many people, and the anguish of what those left behind are going for is 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 indescribable. Um, obviously, my concern about what happens next is partly informed by what's happened before. Um, when we talk about how Israel responds, um, already the Israeli government, which is a far-right government, have made clear that they will institute a policy of collective punishment. The defence minister said, I've ordered a complete siege in the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals and we act accordingly. That, that is the language of war crimes. It is illegal under international law uh, to impose collective punishment on a people. Um, 80 oh, wait, I, can I, I, I'd, let you, I'd let you speak. So you're you're going to respond. 80% of those who live in Gaza, which is an open-air prison, um, depend on humanitarian aid. But you're 50, not acknowledging, Owen. 50, you're not acknowledging, 50%, Owen. Okay. Margaret, not, Margaret no, I've let you, no, I've let no, you speak at using, length. I tell you what I can't stand, mm. is that you're using the horrors that we've no. experienced in the last right. three days to no. bang the drum about an issue no. that you've been banging no. the drum on forever. No, I'm not. And what I think Margaret, you should really Margaret. think about is how you, how, you know, the, Isra the, the people of Israel who have now been there for, a, you know, have nowhere else to go. M Margaret, they have nowhere else to go. Is, is it, poss is it possible? Is it possible for me to respond? Right, right now, Palestinian children, whose life is as sacred as a child in Israel, are being slaughtered. They are dying, OK? Now, 50% of the... Well, can, just, please just, let me finish. I'll, please. I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you come in. 50% of the population of the Gaza Strip are children. And those children are being bombed by a government which has said that we are fighting human animals and we act accordingly. Benjamin Netanyahu demanded the civilians of Gaza Strip leave. You cannot leave the Gaza Strip. It is under okay. blockade by air, sea and land. Now, 96%... Okay. Please let me finish. Yeah, I will, but... 96%, because <laughs> Margaret spoke at length, 96% of those who have died in the last 15 years are Palestinians. And we cannot talk about what's happened, because, you know, when I spoke to my Israeli friend who took that call, for him, what he wants is this to never happen again. And that context for him was so important. Okay. Because unless there is a lasting peace, which does mean ending the occupation okay. and a policy of apartheid okay. and ending the murder of Palestinian civilians, then this will okay. never end. Margaret. Well, all I would say is that Owen is completely and utterly ignoring what has happened over the last few days. I did ignore, you, you I have spoke ignored about it. Owen, just wait, all, just wait. All you've talked about, Owen, is your obsession, the obsession with so many people um, around... Uh, your, I, 
uh, the, pal the issue around Palestine. It's been an obsession forever. And you should just think, just think at the moment, if you were an Israeli sitting there, if you'd had family, I mean, here I am, I'm sitting here, and the people I visited, probably, I don't know how many of them are still alive. Are you saying they have no right to defend themselves? Are you saying they have no right to peace? All you have argued is how... A, I've, I've never supported the Netanyahu government. No. I've always been critical of that. I'm, but at this Morgan, moment, gonna, at this I'm moment gonna, in time, quick, at this respond. moment in have, time, at this have, moment in time, this is the Mo most Margaret, horrific... Margaret. This is the most horrific occasion Margaret, of, of, of uh, and you should, uh, Margaret, you condemn it. Do you even I, condemn I, it? I just opened in the strongest possible terms condemning the atrocities of But you don't think they have the Hamas. right? I don't believe a military solution... You which don't is, think they have a right to defend their state uh, of the Israel? Military solution, to... The military solutions that have been pursued against the Gaza Strip have led to huge bloodshed. You don't bloodshed. think they have the right that to defend themselves? I think a military attack on Gaza will lead to countless dead Israeli soldiers Jeez. and huge numbers so of civilians. they should allow the hostages what is to die? And they I should allow say, the hostages to, say, to Mar die? Margaret, when you, mean, said, you know, when you said, what, this what? Was, when you said, please, it's very difficult to have a conversation if you just speak over each other. I don't think I'm it's really, that nice to watch. You make me really when, angry because you're using this I'm horror. Not, no, Margaret, 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 I am, Margaret, I am, when we're talking... I am I'm going to come in. I have to talk. I am actually going to come in, OK? Right. I'm going to come in. Sorry. Thank you, both of you, for speaking. No, no. We have to no, talk Owen. about the Palestinians being killed now. Owen. That's the point. That's Excuse not an obsession it's my with the issue. Owen. I get that. I, I but to say it's an obsession with Palestine when okay. we're talking about Palestinian civilians it's, it's, who are being killed Thank right you now. very much and their for is equal to those coming on the programme and having the debate. It's Look, it is an... I utterly accept that with babies, children dying... Both. It's, both. And they both yes. matter the same. With but babies and children... Uh, to say that controversial is... I outrageous. think it's pretty clear that with babies and children dying, emotions are running extremely high, and I actually think that this just demonstrates this, well, the emotion that people are feeling, the anger that people are feeling now. Um, now, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, uh, in the context of what has happened in Israel and Gaza, has written to police chiefs calling for stronger action to protect the safety of Jewish people in this country. And it comes after pro-Palestinian protests in London last night, as well as reports of vandalism of some property. In that letter, she wrote this. I'm aware that a number of police forces have already taken operational measures to strengthen the security of Jewish communities, including through increased patrols in neighbourhoods with large Jewish populations. I know that increased visibility of patrols, as well as a swift and zero-tolerance approach to anti-Semitism, will provide our Jewish communities with reassurance that the police are taking this threat seriously and will be there to protect them if need be. And, of course, events in Israel have led to heightened interest in anything around this, this conference that relates to a crisis. As we speak, there's the Labour Friends of Palestine meeting going on and the Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, is attending. Well, our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, joins us from outside that meeting. Sam, what's happening? So I'm in the lowest floor, in the bowels of the Labour Conference uh, Centre. And in this room behind me, uh, Room 2C, as you say, is the annual reception for Labour Friends of Palestine and the Middle East. We're moments away, we think, from David Laddie, Lammy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, uh, from turning up. But Sophie, let me tell you why this is significant. Keir Starmer, shortly after the beginning of those attacks on Saturday morning, laid down the line for the Labour Party, standing with Israel, supporting Israel's um, right to defend itself. You might have expected some people in this party, whose previous leader before Keir Starmer, to take a different view, to challenge that view, to be vocal about that view in this conference, in that room over there, and you can see some of the flags uh, uh, just through the door. But what has been fascinating about this conference, and we'll be taking the temperature in that room, but all around this conference is there has not been that moment of protest. There has not been a moment of challenge to Keir Starmer's line, so different from what you saw under Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, there was a two-minute silence uninterrupted in the hall to recognise what's going on uh, and what has happened. 
in Israel. There are two reasons, Sophie, why this is the case. First of all, an extraordinary behind-the-scenes effort from Keir Starmer's office to make sure there aren't any things that they might regard as embarrassing challenges to his line. Secondly, the left of this party, the people who might have caused trouble, they too want to win the general election. They know that causing trouble for the leader might stop that. So this event, which could have been a flashpoint, we'll be watching closely, but it's a sign of where Keir Starmer is today after that speech, that it, that it probably will pass off with the Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy's speech going probably largely unchallenged. Sam, thank you very much. Sam Coates there, our Deputy Political Editor. You're watching The Politics Hub. We're live from Labour Conference in Liverpool. Still to come. Well, the speech went down well with party members. What do floating voters make of Keir Starmer? We've been to Greater Manchester to find out. Stay with us. news from the sky news center at seven now that you're up to date we can go into a bit more detail things can change incredibly quickly taken by surprise have you ever known a moment like this in british politics before yes <laughs> cheers we'll start with breaking news let's get the latest on the ground so by the end we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. When you think of Glastonbury, it's mud you want and music. They're going to cross to us live in a minute. Okay. Thank you so much. Brad Pitt is now a prolific producer behind the scenes. It's not a mystery to me. We always were capable of doing this. Oh, they're wonderful children as an audience. Who did that? A maverick here on the red carpet. I'm so excited, Tom this is the story of the night. It's a little independent film that could. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Nor have I ever struck any woman in my life. There's this illusion of power. Are you feeling well? I remember covering the Oscars and that now infamous moment, the Will Smith slap. Nobody could quite believe that it happened. You can tell from these crowds just how excited people are for the return of Clyde. These actors playing the lead roles were born long after the Sex Pistols broke up. Are you pleased that you did say yes to the job? I've never regretted it. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world. It can be incredibly surreal being swept up in their world, but we try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. OK, I'll talk to you. Don't leave me! Yeah, OK. <laughs> There's no easy goodies. There's no easy baddies. I've had a great time here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hello, welcome back. You're watching The Politics Hub. We are live from Liverpool at Labour Party conference. Well, Keir Starmer's speech today was inevitably overshadowed by the events in the Middle East, but it has still been an opportunity for him to win over those wavering voters who, if persuaded, could propel him into Downing Street. Our People in Politics correspondent Nick Martin has been speaking to some of them in Ramsbottom, Greater Manchester. The Conservatives held this seat in the last election, but by a whisker, just 150 votes. Here he comes. Smile and nod for the camera. Yeah. Smile and nod. <laughs> Zoe is a single mum of two who votes for whoever she thinks is best for her and her family. And apprentice accountant Jake is a floating voter. I think he seems nervous. I know, yeah. And then the glitter moment. We demand a people's help! So he expects us to think he can secure the country, but... Yeah, he can't secure himself. can't secure himself. <laughs> I will fight for you. That's my mission. Beyond the unplanned handful of glitz, there were references to health, cost of living, education. Britain will get its future back. What were the high points for you? 
I like that he wasn't talking about short-term wins. He was he accepted that um, things are going to take time to fix. That there's a decade of work to be done um, by whoever was in government to get us back to Britain and Great Britain, which was good. Downsides. There was no detail about how he was going to fund it. There was a lot of, we're going to build this, we're going to do this, we're going to fix the NHS, we're going to build colleges and get people in university. There was nothing about how. And Jake, what did you think about that speech? I think he lacks charisma and the personality to really drive the nation forward. I think at this time, such a dire straight, we need someone with that passion. I want to see someone angry on the stage, to be honest with you. So if there was an election tomorrow, would you vote Labour? Probably not. I think he has a long way to go to win my vote. There can be absolutely no doubting the task ahead for Labour. They need to win back all of those voters who turned their back on the party at the last general election. Not just the Labour loyalists, but the floating, wavering voters like Jake and Zoe. The polls are favouring Labour at the moment, but the election's a long way down the track. Nick Martin, Sky News, Ramsbottom. Well, Margaret, I know in our still weathers, we haven't got long left, but a quick thought from both of you. I mean, what did you make of the Keir Starmer speech? Uh, I think it was well delivered compared to many of his other speeches. Um, obviously, our conference speeches, are, they spend months preparing and prepping, and I think that probably showed. Um, the house-building commitment to uh, 1.5 million homes is in the parliamentary term, given the scale of the, house, the housing crisis in this country and the collapse in house building under both, I would say, New Labour and the Conservatives. My, my concern is the scale of the crisis now that has enveloped Britain after 13 catastrophic years of Tory rule. Um, the fact that they have refused to increase taxes on the well-to-do, who are doing very well at the moment, um, and impose very you know, strict iron economic rules gives them very little leeway mm. to raise money for investment um, we can see our schools crumbling, we can see our infrastructure crumbling, we can see our public services, the NHS, mm -hmm. on its knees, record waiting lists. Mm -hmm. um, and my concern is that unless they commit to raising the huge sums of money I think mm -hmm. are desperately needed to fix those, those glaring crises, then I, I fear that the, that the legacy of Tory rule won't be overcome. Margaret, what do you make of that? Well. Surprise, surprise, I disagree. And I think that's because I'm not a person of protest, which is uh, where Owen is. I'm a person who wants to serve. And I think uh, um, Labour totally understands and gets what we're going to inherit, it, which is why Keir said this is a 10-year project. But I felt there was realism, there was responsibility, there was hope, there was hope in it. And there were some real key key promises. Promises: one and a half million homes, a billion into the health service, community police back on our streets, massive investment in economic to ensure we economic are growth. Out of time. Another both disagreement Labour. from both of you, but thank you very much for being on the programme tonight. It's been a look. It's been a really difficult couple of days of news. That is all from Liverpool tonight. Thank you, as always, for watching The Politics Hub. We'll be back tomorrow night at 7. We'll have more from Israel and Gaza on Sky News tonight.